the ball rolling and ask you a question that I have intended to ask you for a very long time. What brought you to India? Because you have mentioned, and I think our audience uh, mostly are young students uh, from the department are very curious to know that you wrote your first novel at the age of 23 when you were a student of BA in our local government college. Not yes, indeed it is. <laughs> now it is. So what brought you to India and how did it help to establish a relationship with English considering that you came from Somalia? Is it possible? Can you hear what? <laughs> well, when what brought me to India, and what did I receive from India, and what did people think? When, instead of going to America, and because I had a scholarship to go to America, two choices, in fact, two choices, one to go to the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and study journalism and literature, and the other one was to go to Eastern Michigan University of Ypsilanti in America, and study literature and philosophy. But I chose instead to come to India for the simple reason that two things. Number one, I knew right away when I was making that decision that America would always come. That there would always be a possibility of going to America. But to come to India and spend three, four years in India was a once-in-a-lifetime option. So I took that option. The response, the reaction of the people, my own brothers and sisters, my friends, my colleagues, my fellow uh, students here, one of whom is sitting right here in this hall, they all thought I was crazy. Why give away a give up going to America in 1966 when you could go to America and come to India which was at that time a famine country. You know, India was almost on the verge of famine. Now my interest, and now I'm reinterpreting, you know, the past to show uh, the reason why I chose to come to India was because I felt deep down that if I had gone to America, I would probably write clever novels, sophisticated literary kind of novels, with very little substance in them, with very little that would touch the humanity in me and the humanity in the character. Why? Because I would have done what many other contemporaries of mine in America would have done, which is to experiment with fiction and to do sophisticated philosophical texts. And then look at your navel gaze, you know, specialize in navel gazing exercises. Whereas I knew that if I came to India, I would be able to feel the pulse of a country. I would be able to learn from the experience on a daily basis and therefore turn that treasure into something worthy of reading. Obviously, as time went on, I would begin to write the kind of novels that I might have written as my first novel. I doubt it very much if from a crooked rib, if I would have written from a crooked rib the way that I have written at the age of 22 if I had gone to America. 
And let me add something else, and that this is very, very important. In the three years that I lived in Chandigarh, I wrote three novels. And the only one that has survived till this day is from a crooked dream. I have no idea what became of the others, and therefore if someone at government call it, please, if you find it, <laughs> give it to me and I will rewrite it. Thank you. I'm interested in finding out that you came from a country that was colonized to another country that was formerly colonized. You had certain languages and I assume that English was your fourth language coming after Italian, Arabic, Amharic. Correct me if I'm wrong. You wrote in all your novels about Somalia. Then why is it that you began to think of writing your first novel from a book in the English language? Well, I... English was my first language. But I have also written in the other languages first. I wrote in the other languages first. And then I discovered that finding a typewriter that worked very well and that wouldn't break at the urgent tapping of my fingers because I was a very fast typist, I thought, it, uh, you know, Olivetti broke down several, I broke uh, several typewriters of the Italian that I was writing in Italian. Arabic was an impossible language you to write because typewriters had not been invented at that time in Arabic. Uh, and I chose English because it was easier to find a typewriter that was sturdy enough to withstand my, you know, uh, clumsiness. And that is one of the reasons why I chose to write in English. <laughs> I have, uh, yes, I wrote a novel in Somali. Is that the only one? Yes, because I, I ran into trouble almost all the time. Mm -hmm. I ran into trouble when I wrote a novel in Somali. I read, ran into trouble when I wrote a play in, in English and went to the you know, uh, stay in Mogadishu in 1969, soon after, after leaving uh, Chandigarh. Um, and so I was always very busy writing and writing. And the only time I haven't been busy writing is when I'm in Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. We haven't given him any time. I haven't written much since coming. I have heard about this play that had to be performed, except that it had a character called Muhammad. And you had that character drink on stage. And that was did considered that, to be blasphemous. And did that have anything to do with your self-imposed exile? I've also heard about your sister carrying a novel after your, you know, you were no longer uh, a person who was allowed to come into Somalia because there was a price on your head and uh, you could have been murdered any time by the authorities and there were attempts on your life as well, two or three times. And your sister who was carrying a so-called banned book, a book written by her brother, was stopped at the airport. Arrested. Arrested at the airport. So it seems that there are a lot of instances that one has heard of uh, in which you appear to be a dissident. Was that willful? <coughs> Were you a revolutionary at heart? Do you try to bring that up in your novels? Well, I don't know revolutionary, but I, I have definitely shown a great deal of interest in expressing, being expressive. I wanted to speak quite openly in a society that was totally and absolutely dictatorial. And, and I think 
many people in the audience would understand when I say, or if I say, that Somali society is dictatorial because dictatorship, the authoritarianism, is within the family. The family controls the individual to the extent that the clothes that you wear are determined by your parents. The food that you eat, the man you marry, the woman you marry, the person you would be seen with, all these things are determined not by ourselves, but by the family. And being the fourth son of a large family, uh, I was in trouble very often, first of all with my father, who in my view was dictatorial. And then later on, I actually saw a correlation between the dictator father and the head of state who is a dictator. In other words, in every family there is the authoritarian figure who represents uh, the dictator and that. And then obviously my interest, even in my first model, was to show that society is dictatorial towards women. That men are allowed to do many things that women are not allowed. They don't have the license to speak their mind about marrying. And in India, I remember there used to be a phrase, I don't know if it still applies, and the phrase used to be, you know, they have a love marriage as opposed to arranged marriage. We need to do that, even now. You still do? You're not allowed to fall in love. Well, you're in trouble here. very important in the context of what you write. Because if, uh, if you ban love, does that become a condition to write a novel? <laughs> and also, you know, uh, other than that is that one is that you encounter an element of authority in the authority in the family structure. But if it replicates at every level, at the level of institution, at the level of street, at the level of city government, so does that mean that uh, uh, novel becomes an excise of, uh, of unfolding the, the multiple layers of the government? Because when I read your novel, close sesame, I don't know why, because open sesame would suggest that you actually are, are trying to unfold that mystery, but now it was a reversal of the kind. So, why do, you, why do you give it a, this kind of subversion, subversion to, the, to the ordinary phase of open, open system, you build up closed system? Well, first of all, the theory in the family. In other words, the father figure is the one who dominates and dominates totally. And then you have in the absence of the father figure, you have the matriarch. Now, in the three novels, for example, of that trilogy, in the first one, it's a very clear, the clear example given is the patriarch who dictates and who is who has a special connection with the dictator in the country, the head of state. He is a police officer does not allow his children to have their own opinions and therefore even informs on his own children and his wife or wives because he had two of them, one of them in secret uh, liaison. The, other, the second part is how women suffer in dictatorship because they suffer doubly in a dictatorship and the reason is because a woman the main character of the novel, Sardines, 
is a journalist, and she's an editor in a newspaper, but she is not allowed to speak, not only as a human being, but she's not allowed, especially because she's a woman. And therefore, whenever she opens her mouth, somebody says, a woman must not be heard. A woman must be silent, obedient, willing only to do things when a man tells her. And then I tried to, to reverse the order. Because the man who is in close enemy, the one that you referred to, described actually as the most uh, spiritual novel ever written in the English language, indicates that if this man, old man, 69 years of age, at the time when I wrote it, I was 32 or 33, and I thought I would, you know, I would never be able to write about an old man. Now I understand. You know, it's actually quite easy to write about those people because they have lots of wisdom. Anyway, he is uh, a very tolerant, willing uh, to negotiate, willing to talk, willing to accept his children, speak to them, to them lovingly. But what he can't, when he finally discovered that the that these young people, there are about five or six of them, and they try to kill the dictator, and they do not succeed. He then becomes, you know, violent and wants to kill the dictator himself. And therefore, that's the reverse. The reverse is an old man who is not of a dead, who is willing to listen to him. And that is the reverse what we know, old men. You, you made an interesting observation that do you think that the power is the most spiritual normal Because I also find that the madness that you attribute to the central character, Giri, yeah. it's madness mixed with some amount of mysticism. Yeah. So, you think that mysticism and bizarre kind of mysticism, mysticism which has all elements of the rationality, can that also be an antidote to dictatorship? In the context of the portrait of the character. Yes, it can. Yes. Because uh, as I see that uh, normally we get characters who are who are mad but and they and their madness is not driven by some transcendental energy. In this case, uh, I find it uh, because this, there's a connection to our, there's a, you know, this mysticism has some connection with our own context because in, in our tradition we find people who are presumably, presumably mad but they are not mad because they are seized by some kind of an unknown mystical spirit and but then they take on that family. So, uh, uh, how do you distinguish it with madness of, say, uh, characters in, in our fiction like in or madness of Foucault or, or, or Faulkner's fiction or madness in, in, in Shakespeare and all Because there is no element, as it appears to me, of this kind of a spiritual ingredient. Well, the madnesses of some of the other characters of whom you have spoken are actually pedestrian madness. <laughs> In the sense that you could actually feel it, you could see there is a great deal of, you know, there is lack of wisdom, there is lack of substantiality. Whereas in the in, in sweet and sour milk, uh, it is in part reminiscent perhaps of uh, Sadat Panto's uh, uh, Yes. And so I think one has to continue keeping in mind that spirituality and the fact that one gives inward self, oneself, totally to spirituality, is also seen by some people as having been touched by the touched in the sense of mad or madness. And that 
with the purpose of it. And the reason is because the old man, the only time he has pleasure in living is when he is in contact with that spirit, listening to the Quran, being read, thinking about, you know, the goodness of humanity. And then, towards the end of the novel, he also becomes man. within the choice, which obviously uh, fall on the top of And then when Somali, and I will talk also about Indian writing in English, but when Somali became a written language in October 1972, given us, you know, lithography, standardized orthography so you could write in it. Three and a half months after that, I started writing a novel in Tom. After the license to stage the play had been withdrawn, what I wanted to do was write a novel in Tom. Now, when I published about two-thirds of the novel, which used to come out in the weekly newspaper, in serialized form, I ran into trouble with the state. And I'd been called in by the censorship board and asked to explain a text. And being something in the region of what? Uh, around 26, 27. I then said, you don't explain text. 
to the censorship board. This is the text. You take it, you leave it. And I ran into trouble and was, you know, detained for a short while. And then publication of my novel in Somali was discontinued. It so happened then that I left Somalia. And then it would happen that I would, you know, leave, leave the country and go to England. Now let me explain that uh, from a crooked drift, my first novel came out in 1970, and then soon after that, after that debacle with the play, disaster. I started a new novel called A Naked Needle. Now, in 1972-73, at the time that I started a novel, I was nervously, you know, writing all the time. I sent off my novel, A Naked Needle, to my publisher in England. The publisher decided on his own that it was unsafe for me to continue living in Somalia if the novel was published in England. So he decided on his own, without letting me know, that it would be dangerous to publish that novel. And then he would wait until I was out of the country and in England for the novel to be published. And then subsequently, as it turns out, I was given 30 years in prison for writing a naked movie, 30 years. And this, was, this would be 1975-1976. Now, at that time, I would have been, let's say, 29 or thereabouts. And I said to myself, you know, I don't want to spend another 30 years in prison. I wouldn't be able to write. It wouldn't be easy, you know, to go back to Somalia. So I did not return to Somalia. Again, the choice was, to hold my pen in midair, waiting for something to happen, or else continue writing whatever language that I could, which is, reminds me of a Somali uh, wisdom that says that hunchbacks learn to live with their discomfort. I am like a hunchback. In other words, writing in English is comparable to a hunchback who must live with his, his discomfort. So English is a discomfort. I would have loved to have written in Somali, but that complicates matters. Supposing I were a writer in Malayalam. If you write in Malayalam, you would be able, you have to decide first of all whether as an Indian, all Indians are your people, or only Malayalam are your people. You have to decide. If you decide that all <coughs> Indians are your fellow nationals, and you want to communicate with them, then you have to decide whether to write in English or Malayalam. And the reason is, in terms of distribution, in terms of sales, in terms of However you look at it, writing in Malayala is another hunchback discomfort. <coughs> writing in English is a hunchback discomfort. And the reason is because the languages in which we receive our intellectual makeup are usually not the mother tongues which we speak at home. You know, you could say to someone, go and make me some parata, but if you wanted to talk about you know, uh, Einstein, and you wanted to talk about Russell's and so on and so forth, Bertrand Russell, there are these other difficulties. So you have to make the choice. Do I want to remain a Canada writer, writing in Canada, 
and then exclude all the other Indians? Or do you want... No one has found a simple... In other words, it's not a very simple as uh, you fellow academics make it. <laughs> no, it is, it is certainly not simple because even, even the question of India, you know, uh, and uh, if I'm a writer, if I don't want to write in Malayalam and I want to appeal to all Indians, then even that is a problem as to who are those Indians and what language do they share because then they don't share any other language except what is called the linked language of English. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it is, of course, a series of compulsions as well, one might say, or, uh, you know, choices which are not really choices turn out not to be choices, uh, in a way. Uh, there's another question that emerge, emerges from your readings of three of your works from different uh, periods of time, and that is the growth of, that is about the art of writing, that the growth of interiority in your work, because it seems if, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, whether uh, the audience has observed that or would, uh, would agree with that, that there is a change in the, uh, in the manner of uh, uh, description from, uh, in the novel from a crooked rib, right through to maps. And uh, uh, what, uh, what I felt was that there was some development of a great deal of interiority uh, which uh, is evident in the sentence structures and in the modifications and elaborations of and qualifications of the phrases that you are using in the later, in the later work, the later telling, the later narrative. And it seems that the narrative voice has modulated itself in various ways in this process. Um, and then the, the, your observation about uh, whether if you had gone to America, you would have adopted a certain kind of fictional style which, uh, or fictional styles which were prevalent or are prevalent in that kind of writing. So, you know, one of your fellow African writers, Murugi Vatyong, who is now working in the University of California. And I think in the post-colonial world, he has inspired so many writers to write in their native languages. Then he was writing in Pali and then he went back to the United States and he started writing in English again. But he translates his works back into his mother tongue. My question to you, sir, is that you have a close connection with your realities and you also mentioned because your mother she was, you know, she also was very well connected with your realities of your language. So have you ever thought about it that you would translate your work back into your mother tongue or now you feel that your experience is too expansive and you cannot contain it in your realities of your language? Thank you. And thanks for reminding me that we met in Cape Town. Uh, number one, I always write a trilogy and that usually means that when I start the first part of a book of a trilogy, I know what goes into the second and the third. And that is a handicap. The handicap is, I know well ahead and usually they take between six and nine years to complete the trilogy. Let me make a correction, a small little correction if you will allow me. And that is, Ngugi translated only one of his books into Kukui. And Ngugi has written only two books in Kukui. He has about 21 books and he has written only two books. And therefore there is an element, he is a great friend of mine, but there is an element of grandstanding politics that is there. And the reason is because if you've written 21 books and only two books 
are written in your mother tongue. That's one. The second thing is, we go back to what I said before when I was talking to Professor Seah, and that is, do you decide, from the initial moment you decide to write in a language, whether or not you want to communicate at the same time to all the Kenyans. In Kenya, they speak 25 languages. He writes in Kikuyu, which is the majority country, majority people, majority community in Kenya. That means that there is a certain amount of injustice about giving priority to the language of people who dominate politically in Kenya. And therefore, do you actually want to carry your message to everyone in your nation? Or do you want to isolate yourself from your own fellow Kenyans? This is a debate that continues, and I hope it will continue. I hope it will continue. I am not done with it in the sense that Somalia actually is the only country in the continent of Africa where everybody speaks or understands Somali. So it would have been very easy for me to write in Somali. And the reason is because literally every Somali who knows how to read. But reading is also, you know, nation, some of these people are illiterate. Majority of Somalis are illiterate. 75% are illiterate. 25% can read in one language or the other. And the 25% who can read, read in European languages, not in African languages, not, you know. Now, with regard to, there was another point that I was going to make. I ran too fast before Trans I walked. Translation, translation of your own work. The translation of my own work, I don't have the time, to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't have the time to tie my shoelaces. <laughs> and for that reason, I don't, uh, you know, I won't be able to do justice to the work. Often, from a crooked river has been translated into Somali, and I'm hoping that more and more books will be translated into Somali. But it's one of those things, and maybe, you know, uh, somebody will translate them into Somali. As a matter of fact, uh, I have told my literary agent in New York, literary agents in both New York and uh, uh, London, that if somebody translates a book into Somali, because of the conditions in Somalia, I don't require royalty from such translators. And people know it, I've said it so many times, and that is the position that I take. And I thank you. Yes, twice. Yes. <laughs> Professor uh, Farah, I realize you come from a land which has seen uh, nightmares of history. I realize you come from Somalia, where there has been turmoil for almost three to four decades. You come from Rwanda. You come from, uh, from South Africa, where there has been apartheid for almost a century. My question is that when you come from this kind of a land where there is unbridled violence, does this kind of debased politics breed debased language? Language becoming coarse because of the politics being coarse. I'm saying this because this is a famous statement by Orwell that debased politics breeds coarse language. I say this because another statement that was made in Europe after Auschwitz, which is that there would be no poetry written after Auschwitz, said by Adorno, that famous critic from the Frankfurt School. Apparently, when you have this kind of bloodshed and genocide, does that bring about some kind of 
a transformation in the psyche that numbs it, that makes it, in fact, uh, not creative enough? Or do you think that this kind of a disturbance where you come from gives you some kind of an impetus, a creative incentive to go into this creative act that you have actually gone into? Would you really say that because the writers write so well, they bring in that kind of a solidarity of experience? Because the written word itself becomes an antidote to violence. Or is it the other way around, that violence breeds nothing but a coarse language? And therefore it becomes important to refine language, as I see that you have refined your language. Thank you. Now, let me remember a story, uh, an explanation given by a Swedish writer once said to an African writer, you people are so lucky, said the Swedish writer. There are always things to write about. <laughs> Presumably, we could say the same thing about India, but I won't. The important thing, I think, for me, at any rate, The important thing is to write and ennoble the memory and the life of the debased communities so that one can uplift them, show their humanity, and then say that almost all the violence, all the terrible things that are being done to them by the authoritarian regime or by the mad mobs that go around killing people in Rwanda or Somalia or for that matter, anywhere else. And to reclaim, to reclaim the honorable position of simply saying, this is an aberration. We're all human beings, and we have the dignity of a human being. And that can only be done if one writes about it, in a dignified manner. Now, the debasement of the individual or the community, the debasement, is temporary in the history of the world. Temporary in the sense short-lived in the sense that these things happen. Somalia, 30 years. Prior to that, there have also been violence, but not to the same degree as it is happening now. And therefore, that violence gives you moments for meditation. And then you study the victims, you study the perpetrators of that violence, the criminals, and so on and so forth. That, I think, is the essence of writing. Because the more you write, the more you make whatever is happening available to others. I'm not going to live forever, but the books that I write, one hopes, would survive and then tell people in another 30, 40, 50 years, or even 100 years, that these things have happened. I come from a society that's totally oral. Somali oral poetry is one of the best, but that poetry may even be forgotten without, and unless we have technology. You see, and technology, the technology of which I'm speaking, the tape recording or the video in and all this, are actually, they belong more to the written tradition that they belong to the oral tradition. So debasements can only be elevated to a level where the human receives respect. If we acknowledge the existence of that debasement, deliberate debasement, and if we fight against you know the idea of giving in. I've been fighting from Perhaps the day I was born, I wasn't there, but you know, from then on. 
and will continue. We'll continue fighting in any way I can. And writing is one. So would you say then that if art survives, then book survives? Or if book survives, then art survives? And if art survives, then man survives? Sure. And that's the survival. Oh, yeah. Through art. Yeah. yeah. So it becomes an antidote to sure. violence and war. Sure. And sure. the basement. Yeah. Yes, I would agree with you absolutely. I would agree with you absolutely. So, I'm Pankaj Malviya, teaching Russian language and literature in this university. The very famous Russian writer Anton Chekhov was a prolific story writer in Russian literature. I have read somewhere it's a I have read somewhere that he wrote more than 150 short stories in a year. And one of the most striking features of his short stories was, as he used to say, liberty is the sister of talent. And he was so observant about the things around him that he used to say that if you put an ashtray before me, the next day we will get a story about it. My question is, while you staying in India this time, are people, I mean people you met or the places you visited in India are going to be reflected in your coming literary work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I should first of all say that I don't write as perhaps as easily as uh, Chekhov does. At times when I write, it's worse than going to the dentist and to have a tooth pulled out. And therefore, I envy someone like uh, Chekhov. However, one can never actually determine what goes into the writing. I could be looking at someone and then talking to them for two, three minutes and then later they may figure in a text. I don't think that I am likely to write about the people who become friends. And the reason is because friends read one's own books and nobody likes to be portrayed in a book. Uh, and so I would say that as much as I have enjoyed being here the past two weeks, I doubt it very much if the people whom I have met will be figuring in the new book, if I were to write. If I understood the question. If I understood it. Yes, that was it. Last question, please. This gentleman in a uh, pink, pink t-shirt, third row. You, are, you raise your hand? No. Someone with, yeah, yeah. That, sorry, yeah. Last question. Good afternoon, sir. Good so I'm very much inspired by your words and phrases and uh, the way you answer the questions, getting the inner sight of your intellect. I would just like to ask you to say a few words for the aspiring writers and artists. Just a few words. Thank you. I, I usually say to young aspiring writers or even old aspiring writers, <laughs> I can tell you I know one who is going to be writing a novel and he or she is in her mid-sixties and therefore, yes. Anyhow, uh, what I usually say to people, to writers, to hope to write. 
And writing requires plenty, plenty of patience. Sitting where you are, hour in and hour out, untiring, loyal to the idea of writing, continuing writing, even when you are unable to write. <coughs> and I used to say, now I no longer say it, I used to actually say to my friends, and when you become friends of mine, I'll say that to you, <laughs> that if you sit in one place in a room or an apartment or a house, day in, day out, for six months, with the intention of writing. And you do not go out, you do not go mad, or kill yourself. <laughs> then you will be able to produce something. Whether what you produce is worthy of keeping and publishing is a completely different story. In other words, what I'm saying is, I always say to people, don't give up. Write. No one can teach you to write. No one. When I was at the, at the government college, I had one professor who was very good uh, at, uh, he was a specialist in Virginia Woolf, his name was N.C. Taco. He was my, you know, my favorite uh, teacher in that he, you know, shared opinions and talked about writing and so on and so forth. But the thing to remember, the thing to remember is patience I would say 75% of writing is patience. 25% has something to do with talent. And that, I think, is what I would uh, uh, suggest. One thing that I also say, this has now become a cliche, that if, if you are able to do it, the ideal situation would be to devote the same number of hours, whether it's morning or afternoon or evening or whatever time it is, to write it. And I give the example of milking a cow. If you are milking a cow and one day you come to milk the cow at 7 o'clock in the morning, the next day you come at 8, the third day you come at 9 o'clock, you're not likely to get any milk out of that cow. Whereas if daily you come to, the, to milk the cow at the same hour, then the cow would produce the milk, put it in its udder, and will be waiting for you to come and reclaim that milk. So I would say, ideally, if you start work at 9 o'clock in the office, probably you can wake up at 6 o'clock, Work for one hour every day, from 6 until 7, go shower, get into your car, and go to work. Right, and how to become a bestseller. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nuruddin Farah.